Continuing the trend from my last PlayStation 2 review, Altered Beast, we are covering another extremely conflicting game, one with wide peaks and valleys of quality, that being Nano Breaker, Konami's prototype to the never-endingly memeable Metal Gear Rising. I'm only half-joking here, because so much of this game's plot and world-building holds funny parallels to the Metal Gear Solid IP and to Metal Gear Rising specifically, with an opening cutscene that looks like it was taken straight out of Drakengard. The setup for this game is that the nanomachines implanted into people living on this island have gone rampant, turning them into monsters called Orgamex. The government then takes out of cryostasis a white-haired cyborg ninja with a high-frequency blade that runs on the blood of his enemies as fuel, telling him that he needs to go in there and stop the supercomputer AI that is causing all of this. If the computer virus is infecting people, then I need to get a human virus to infecticide the computer. This time voiced by Crispin Freeman, and instead Sundowner is voiced by Steve Bloom. Of of course not credited in game, just like the Sword of Etheria, Nano Breaker is a PlayStation 2 action game by Konami where they're not crediting the people who are voicing their characters in English. You might have already noticed based on what I've shown so far, but the game goes for an approximation of what reality is within the confines of what the PlayStation 2's limitations are, while taking some artistic liberties and embracing its gamey arcadey nature with the over-the-top cartoon gore. As I mentioned in the intro, Jake runs off the blood of his enemies, or oil as it's referred to in-game, but come on, we all know what this really is. There's even an option in the settings menu to change the color of the oil with a ton of colors to choose from, one being rainbow, so a large crowd of enemies getting comboed results in a fireworks display of color. The particle effects in the after image trails left by your sword and other abilities still look really good today and gives the combat a super striking and unique look to it. I always love when games, especially from this era, give their combat a unique visual flair like this to make them both stand out and stand the test of time. I really wish it was something that later generations still stuck with, but it seems like we've moved away from things like your sword's energy slashes or Shinobi's scarf. But with games like Hi-Fi Rush, Geno Kids, Jamphibian, and many more that I want to talk about in their own dedicated video, it seems like indie games are starting to bring action games back into the right direction. The combat system of Nano Breaker has all of the makings of a top-tier prestigious action game with customizable combos, unique weapon variations, excellent attack designs, a versatile move list, great attack ranges, but then the game itself is really stiff and missing a lot of the connective tissue found in better action games. Right away, you can tell something is a little off, as the prompts for the combos versus the tutorial boss are somewhat misleading. In other games, this prompt would signify that you need to hit both buttons at the same time, but what it actually wants you to do is press them in a sequence. They really should have put an arrow or a comma between the two buttons, just to prevent any form of confusion. But at least the pause menu does clear this up somewhat. As I mentioned a minute ago, the game has customizable combos, not in the same depthful way as God Hand or Stranger of Paradise. Instead, you use these plug-in chips collected throughout the game to fill out branching trees of combos, being able to remove and replace them into different slots as you please. Some of these moves have a video demonstration of what they look like and what they do, but then there are a bunch of moves in these combo trees you can't even highlight or cursor over, and will just pass right over them to the next thing. I don't know why they made it like this, but I wish they didn't. If you watched my review of Ghost Rider and remembered what I said there, Nano Breaker was one of the games I showed on screen when talking about missing the combat components that ties combos on the ground and combos in the air together. This game has a really good launcher, but unlike Devil May Cry, Bujin Guy, and many others, there is no way to follow up enemies into the air or jump after the launcher because you are animation locked to the ground. Air combat is another thing that is basically non-existent in this game. You have a downward thrust, a horizontal slash on square, a vertical slash on triangle, and that's it. Outside of this game's version of Wire Snatch when holding down the circle, the game does not have a dedicated lock-on. This leads to the standard issue that plenty of these games have, where you are awkwardly swinging at the air, missing enemies because your stiff character model doesn't have the ability to focus on them. And the Wire Snatch's lock-on isn't even all that good itself, as there are plenty of times throughout my playthrough, where it would just not go to the enemy it's locked onto, or be unable to find them in the environment even though they are right in front of me. So the wire would just fly out into thin 
air at nothing. Then there are the real combat flow breakers and the completely unexplained things like the wings that occasionally pop out of your back. I have no clue what these do or signify. One of the many annoying things in this game are the enemies that can only be hit by specific attacks like the scorpions can only be damaged by the javelin, or the enemies that can only be hurt by either horizontal or vertical attacks like these clam things depending on the way they're opened. When fighting in a huge crowd, this results in you getting hit and your combos being dropped because you aren't actually damaging all of them with everybody else because they are invulnerable. Nano Breaker has the same issue I described Bujin Guy having where at any time it deviates from the standard point A to point B arena to arena fighting then story beat, it becomes a much worse game. There are these escort mission segments where you have to protect the female scientist so you guys can try to put a stop to the Orgamex uprising. For some reason they decided that hey, for a character with a lot of wide AoE attacks and no way to lock onto the enemies outside of the grab, let's turn on friendly fire. So when the game is throwing 50 enemies at you while you're trying to protect this lady, I got dangerously close a few times to accidentally killing her because there's no real way to avoid hitting her when the enemies have you guys surrounded. Also like Bujin Guy, it contains annoying platforming segments. These are way worse in my opinion due to how stiff and bad the jumping and movement feels in this game. Nano Breaker does that thing that just drives me insane with platformers. When you try to jump and you're too close to the ledge and you do it maybe just a bit too late, the game will end up eating your input and you are sent plummeting to your death in the bottomless pits. You don't actually die from these in this game, but it does reset the area so combat encounters are required to be redone again. Combine this with the moving platforms, temporary platforms, long recovery animations from double jumping or landing too close to ledges and the bad camera that gets caught on things and gets too close to the player character, it makes me rather fight the annoying enemies in this game like the little bugs that I could not figure out how to get off your body until they explode if they grab onto you, which also stops you from attacking the other enemies in the room. So this ends up making you take guaranteed damage which unless you get a rare health pickup or a health reset from progressing past a certain point in the story, you are shit out of luck. There were so many times throughout my playthrough where it felt like the best option was to just stand around and grind kills against respawning basic enemies until they dropped a health pickup or absorb enough gallons of blood that I would get a random health increase or heal. Now imagine all the stuff I just said when fighting really unforgiving bosses that hit like a truck have tons of invincibility frames and phases for no reason, one frame startup blocking similar to Ninja Gaiden Black's Doku boss fight, insta kills, terrible hitboxes, horrible 10 minute phases before the real fight starts, and by the end you'll never Ever want to touch this game ever again. Once I had finished the game on stream, I was so salty, extremely bitter. I had felt that the game burnt away all the goodwill it had built up over the first few hours. But let's take some time and a step back to actually talk about some of the positives. So at least it makes sense why I said that this game has me conflicted, yet all I've done is complain for the past 10 minutes. The story for this game is unintentionally hilarious, elevated by its cheesy early 2000s English dub. With tropey hallmarks like the nerdy scientist explaining what's happening only for the army man to go in English please. Jake is Shadow the Hedgehog level serious and he never breaks this mold only to be followed up by utter cornballs like this game's sundowner Keith who is going completely mental and chewing up every scene he is in. Anytime Keith is on screen with Steve Bloom doing his most gravelly goblin voice producible while Crispin Freeman completely no sells every interaction with him brought a smile to my face every single time. Think you can just blow me off like that? Your arrogance! Pisses me off! Jake radiates that, Oh, I'm so tragic. I suffered such a deep emotional scar previously that I'm too cool to ever react to anything happening in this game. The dude can get so melodramatic and self-serious that he makes Ben Riley look like Makunochi Ippo. On the topic of that self-seriousness, this game has the perfect level of mid-2000s edge to it. It's so quaint by today's standards where everything is irony, poison, Josh Weed, and quipping. But the one thing that stood out as jarring no matter what happened in the game was some of the music choices. The music isn't bad, mind you, but given the circumstances of what is happening to everybody on the island and all of the monsters you are ripping through, some of the music sounds like it was straight out of a circus performance. Oh. 
The game gets seriously goofy at times, especially in combination with the music it just brought up, and there is no chance that they thought that this was in any way supposed to be comedic when making it, and that makes it the best kind of campiness, completely unintentional. And once again, we are ending our game on an annoying three-phase gauntlet, with the final boss being a charisma vacuum prototype Armstrong, where the first phase has you running around a circular arena, slashing at tentacles dangling from the ceiling so you can attack the main head in the center, otherwise you deal no damage to it if there are any tentacles spawned in, and if the main head hits you it does half your health bar, all the while having floating robot eyes that shoot lightning at you that go off screen so you can't see them or lock onto them with the wire snatch because this segment is a side scroller for some reason, then phase 2 is the brain of the giant head you were hitting, slowly slithering across the stage while regular enemies spawn in. Both of these segments combined take roughly 10 minutes depending on your RNG, only then does the real final boss fight start, when Armstrong shows up and absorbs the brain of the king of all the nanomachines and becomes a monster with an actual cool design that I can't even hate on, this guy looks sick as fuck. His boss fight may be terrible, and it made me absolutely salty on stream, but I have to admit that he looks so cool. After running around hitting him for 5 minutes with zero hit feedback while dodging a million attacks as he spawns in multiple copies of himself, you'll beat the game and then unlock the ability to replay it as Keith with his own unique move list. If you manage to beat the game with him and not turn it off and never touch it again, because honestly it's not all that fun even when I take off my rose tinted glasses for my love of this genre and time period, you unlock the ability to play as Jaguar from Neo Contra, who is just a palette swap of Jake but seems to be a super character minus the double jump. This also unlocks you splatter mode, which is kinda like Bloody Palace as you have to kill enough enemies to absorb enough gallons of blood to unlock the next stages. The first one takes place in the void of space and it looks really cool, but with all of the combat shortcomings like the game as a whole, it doesn't reach its true potential. Man, why couldn't this game be good from start to finish? Instead, we got a game that starts out strong with a lot of promise, hits a midpoint with a decent amount of system mechanics, but is being held back from its true potential, then nosedives right into complete frustration with bosses, enemy encounters, amounts of backtracking with how slow you are, shitty platforming segments, and the list goes on. No amount of silly campy cutscenes can carry a game like this. I don't care if the homeless man living in the sewer shows up at the end with a nice-ass car to drive you off a cliff as the island explodes and cuts to credit. Credits. The last two to three hours of this game had me so salty that it changed what was going to be a really positive review into something I imagine comes off pretty negative to the viewers. I still say give it a try, but if you bounce off it at the start, it's only going to get worse from here on out, so it's probably not worth suffering through. If anything, watch the cutscenes on YouTube because you can probably get a good laugh out of them. If you've made it this far into the video, I just want to say thanks for watching as always. If you really like the channel, then please consider passing the video around, leaving a like and a comment, and maybe consider becoming a patron on Patreon. All patrons get access to videos a day early, along with a $7 tier that shows rough cuts of upcoming videos, like my currently in the work anime boxing video. I'm now going to shout out all of my $5 and up patrons. Applejuice426, Burley, BBF and Blocksburg, Bergnut, Bully, Densha, Jordan Bennett, Kohai Carmen, Cosmonaut Cola, Medina the bad guy, Nemphy, Quanner, Quartz, Revan, Rovit, Samuel Egan, Scary Dinosaur, Sir Newt Newt, Skullman, Walkman, Ben Johnson, Buckets, Chichometrius, Cursed Void, David Roberts, Ekfrazo, Elliot Morton, Filthy Finger 69, Fishkami, Hard Leg Joe, Kevin Velasquez, Lazy Titan, Leon, Lotto, Lucy the Fox, Mitchell, Nicholas Pedinato, Sean the Berserker Fighter, Simply Aiden, Slemph Tingle, Starcasters, The Worstest Guy, and William Moore. Thanks so much, guys. As for what's coming out next, I still have a lot of videos in the works, including things like the Drakengard Retrospective, the Armored Core series review, the Onimusha series review, which you can go view the review for the first game on Patreon if you're a $7 tier or up. There's also still a lot of other smaller projects still in the works, so to keep up to date, follow me on Twitter. If you're a card game player of any kind, I have a TCG Player affiliate link in the description below. Any purchases you make will give me a small kickback. I also have a NordVPN affiliate link, which using my promo code in the description below will also help support the channel and give you a discount on a two-year plan. That's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.